and you had an environment where there were books that were uh, there. Had, there had a small library within the encampment where uh, you had books about Naomi Klein, Noam Chomsky on Palestine, Edward Said. So all these students were taking these books, and you just you could just loan them out, and they were becoming exposed to all these you know critical thinkers that you know they, they had books on like manufacturing consent, which like you know 18, 19 years year old they would have never been exposed to that had they not been part of this encampment. So you added. The encampment was a really educating atmosphere. It was a very like uh, a very welcoming, very uh, uh, you know like a holistic kind of uh, environment. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I got with me for the second time Pitasana Shamugatas, who is a Canadian journalist and filmmaker. He produced the documentary Truth to the Powerless an investigation into Canada's foreign policy, which investigates and dismantles the image of Canada as a peacemaker and pacifist country. Um, I interviewed him about this uh, about one and a half years ago, so check check that one out if you want to, or like uh, even better, watch the documentary. Um, I'll put all the links into the description. Uh, Peter Sana is now uh, also a law student at Vermont Law School, from where he contributes to the Pittsburgh-based law student magazine, The Jurist. Uh, he has been observing and writing about the student protests, as well as about Canadian foreign policy, and that's what we want to talk about today. So, Peter Sana, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Pascal. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before we start, where can people find your documentary about Canada? Uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, the documentary is free to watch. It's a six-part docuseries, and you can watch it at www.truthtothepowerless.com. And it's a very unique documentary because we interview the politicians that are, were responsible for formulating and championing Canada's foreign policy. And then we, we contrast that by interviewing academics, like uh, distinguished academics like Noam Chomsky and uh, Canadian activists, and critical uh, dissidents. So you get both sides, you get the establishment view and you get the, the dissenting narrative challenging that. So it's a really cool documentary, six part doggy series for free. Anybody can yeah. watch it. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, you, you, you really, I mean, you're, you're obviously caring about Canada and you're kind of trying to dismantle the, the, the narrative blob on top and show like what it what it actually was but let we will do this in the second part of this talk because first i would like to know a little bit about your experience with the student protests because you have been on several campuses right and and you've you've observed them and you've written about them um so we are recording this video on the 28th of may uh by now what is the status and how did it go over the last couple of months so I, I did my undergraduate and my graduate studies at the University of Toronto. <clears throat> so that's the um, uh, the protests that are happening there. The encampment that's happening there is the one that I'm most familiar with, although I've taken part in the protests in, in the U.S. as well. Um, but in terms of the University of Toronto, uh, there have been, uh, you know, hundreds of students, faculty members that have, uh, that have uh, sat in... Uh, uh, what they call the People's Circle, which is a it's a King's College circle. It's um, they renamed it the People's Circle, the protesters, and uh, they've set up tents and and they've camped out there overnight. Students, faculty members, calling for the University of Toronto to disclose uh, their investments uh, towards any Israeli firms that are connected uh, to the occupation of the Palestinian territories. The University of Toronto, for the longest time, has refused to disclose uh, their investments. They've, they've refused to disclose their financial ties to Israeli firms that are connected to the occupation, the firms in general that are connected to the Israeli occupation. And uh, the University of Toronto refused to engage with the uh, protesters. I spoke with, I went to the University of Toronto and I sat in. Uh, as part of the protests, and uh, I spoke with many of the uh, protesters. Many of them are quite young, and they're younger than me. They're students, and um, I'll just I'll mention a personal story. I was a I was an undergraduate and a graduate student at the University of Toronto. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I was a graduate student at the University University of Toronto's Monk School. The Monk School of Global Affairs is a leading foreign policy school in Canada. It's kind of like an elite 
Global Fair School. So it was funded, the Monk School is funded by the Peter Monk family. Peter Monk is one of the, uh, is the founder of Barrick Gold, the, one of the largest gold mining companies in the world. So Bear Gold goes into the Global South and they extract, uh, you know, uh, they extract, uh, they do a mining extraction and they pollute the ecosystems. They they expel villagers. Uh, Bear Gold security forces have raped villagers and they've been connected to a huge number of human rights abuses in the Global South. And Peter Monk funds the Monk School. So it's a very elite Global Affairs School. One of my professors was Canada's former defense minister. And I ended up interviewing him for Canada's, uh, uh, in my, my Canada docu series. And I tried as a student at the Monk School to uh, organize a discussion on the Palestinian refugee crisis uh, as part of uh, a student club that we were running as part of the Monk School. The discussion was uh, carried out. And um, as part, one of the panelists we invited was Francesca Albanese, who is the, who's now the UN Special Rapporteur on Palestine back then. She had just released the second edition of a book called Palestinian Refugees and International Law. And so I wanted to do a panel discussion about Palestinian refugees on, and how they're being treated in international law. So we invited her. We invited a, a Palestinian doctor who was also on the faculty at UFT, Izzeldin Abolesh. His children were killed in Gaza. He's Palestinian. His children were killed in 2008, uh, 2009 in the Israeli war. Uh, uh, in an Israeli airstrike, and uh, we invited him to give his personal testimony about, you know, the, how Palestinians are mistreated. And and he's the, he's one of the most wonderful people on earth. I had him on this channel. He's one of the most oh, humanistic amazing. people in on earth. So he's really absolutely fantastic. And you invited him. Uh, yes, and and he spoke, and Francesca Albanese spoke, and her co-authors of the book spoke as well. It was a great discussion, well attended. Uh, it was recorded when it came time to publish that recording onto U of T's social media. Uh, the uh, the Monk School got back to us students and told us uh, the talk did not align with our format. And so we will not publish the talk. So even though it was well attended, it got great you know feedback from the audience. The U of T Monk School refused to publish it. And this was in... Um, 2020. So within four years, uh, the, the University of Toronto has gone light speed in terms of progress as far as Palestinian discourse is concerned. I couldn't even get a Palestinian talk published that I had done. It was the first Palis uh, talk on the Palestinian refugee crisis that U of T, the Monk School, had ever done. And I, and I was the one who organized it. I couldn't even get it published. Now, fast forward four years later, you have such huge discourse on the Palestinian refugee uh, issue, on on uh, on Palestinian occupation. You have faculty that are taking part in it. Mainstream media is covering it. It's enormous progress. So, so to see these students who are camping out, uh, who are you know demanding that the University of Toronto disclose their financial investments, so the the university refused to meet with the students, and. Um, uh, the university actually issued a notice saying that any faculty that remain, uh, uh, that do not clear the encampment by 8 a.m. Monday morning, which is uh, uh, today, uh, I'm on Eastern Standard Time, so it's, it's, it's 8 a.m. has passed, and faculty and the students refuse to leave the encampment. So the university has said, okay, we will disclose our uh our our we would disclose our investments, but we will not uh, disclose indirect investments that are aiding the Israeli occupation. So they're waffling on that. So they've offered they've offered that, and the president uh, of the University of Toronto, who had refused to meet with the students, really refused to engage with the students. He he eventually met with them, but refused to really engage with any of their substantive demands. He says that as part of his uh, most recent offer that he will have full veto over you know any any decision that um, uh, that comes about that if he doesn't agree with a particular demand, he will strike it from the record. So that's the that's the new that's the latest offer that the University of Toronto, the, the president has put forth that he will disclose all direct investment, that there will be no disciplining measures 
for the faculty and staff. Uh, so 8 a.m. has passed Monday. So he's walked back his his threat to discipline the, st uh, the staff because you saw how in Columbia University in the U.S. there was a, a students were being suspended, faculty was being you know uh, threatened, it, you know, faculty were being arrested. It was this whole huge thing. It got international coverage, condemnation. So the University of Toronto is very keen not to um, repeat that. Also, graduation happens in June at the University of Toronto. And what the protesters told me is that the university does not want any disruptions. So June is uh, <laughs> it's approaching very quickly. Graduation usually happens around June 15, if I remember correctly, from my graduation and my undergrad and graduate program. So uh, the University of Toronto is under a real time cooker to really get a, a, a negotiated solution, which is why the president has finally said, okay, we will disclose direct investment, but we won't disclose indirect investment. Also, what's interesting note at the encampment itself is that there are surveillance cameras that are installed, that were just recently installed, which uh, analyzed uh, the facial, which has facial recognition technology, audio recognition technology. So I was there and they had these cameras installed in the perimeter of the encampment. And, uh, and it, apparently these cameras are being uh, done uh, in conjunction with the uh, RCMP, which is the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, the highest ranked police uh, in Canada. So they're engaging in surveillance, they're engaging in identity collection, and uh, you know uh, we don't know what they're gonna use it for, but that was something that's very alarming. And um, so that's basically what's happening at the University of Toronto, which is the one I'm most familiar with. So uh, on the one hand, what we are seeing in Toronto and over the Columbia and so on is that student protests have real impact, right? The, the, the student protests and just by sheer fact that, that a lot of people stay in the, same, in the same ground, in the same place and block access to certain buildings, you are able to move uh, discussions with the university leadership, but also get noticed by uh by 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 media and i i mean we've seen how for the first time joe biden in the u.s uh withheld some weapon uh, deliveries which immediately made, made the right wing go crazy and it's like oh this is outrage i mean israel's gonna die tomorrow if it doesn't get all of these bombs in order to kill even uh 35 000 more palestinians um <clears throat> which is absolutely lunatic but but we've seen that there is some impact on the one end on the other side what you're saying now is also that uh, the state is going more authoritarian again. It's, it's very reminiscent of the 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 the, the freedom convoy during during uh, uh, Corona in 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 Canada, in which like really brutal measures were used in order to break up this uh, public protest and make it impossible for people to protest. Now it's not on that level yet, but we are seeing kind of both things playing out at the same time. So what are the students now trying to do? Are they content with just the, the direct investments, because the interesting thing, of course, is if the if the director says that uh, we will uh, disclose only the direct ones, not the indirect ones, is that he admits that there's a lot of indirect ones that they are aware of, <laughs> and, and that 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 might be even more important and more scammy or more fishy or more you know problematic than the direct ones. Um, what do you make out of that? Do you think do you think this will this will fly? Uh, I think that what I'm getting from the students and what they're communicating uh, on social media, they're really effective in using social media and really spreading their message and really updating, uh, you know, young millennials about what's going on. And uh, what my impression is, this just happened recently. So my impression is that they're not going to stand for it. They want to know about all the investments, direct and indirect that the University of Toronto is engaging in, which is sustaining, aiding the Israeli occupation. And all they have to do is kind of just uh, wait out uh, President uh, uh, Mayor Gertler, who's the U University of Toronto president, and just wait him out until graduation comes. Because once graduation comes, June, I think it's 15, after, I don't know the date, but it's mid-June. Uh, and if all these protesters are there, they're right in front of Convocation Hall, which is where graduation happens. And when it's when we don't when when graduations don't happen, we use it as a lecture hall. But Convocation Hall is, is right outside Convocation Hall is where the encampment is. So <laughs> it, 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 there's no way that the graduation can happen uninterrupted. 
if uh, the president does not strike a deal with uh, with the protesters. So all they have to do is just wait two weeks or so. And if they're gonna, and if the president, you know, is gonna send the police, then it's gonna it's gonna be a huge situation. And it's gonna cause, uh, I think, significant blowback to the university. And there's gonna be some legitimate concerns about, uh, you know, free expression, about student expression. Uh, and I think that the president is very cautious about not to have a repeat of the situation in Colombia, and he seems to be determined to, at the one hand, keep his job, which. Uh, is dependent upon these high wealthy donors that are investing into the University of Toronto. Uh, many of them, I suspect, have links to the Israeli occupation, to Israeli firms that are aiding the occupation that he does not want to upset. His position is very much, he feels dependent on pleasing them. And on the other hand, he doesn't want to be seen as too authoritarian by sending the police and being viewed as this kind of dictator and kind of how things played out in Colombia. So it's a very, he's kind of juggling. It's a very, it, it, I mean, for somebody who doesn't really, if you had a moral compass, you would be willing to sacrifice your job in order to, you know, disclose the investments and do what's moral just thing to do. But this is somebody who cares about his job and he's trying to balance both, uh, I guess, both interests. So it's, yeah. I, it's, it, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a position I admire. I mean, it's nothing I would want to have because, on the one hand, he has responsibility towards the student. On the other hand, he has responsibility towards the institution and making sure that they can run. If whatever he does ends up in slashing their budget in half, it means like closing down half the university next year, which would, <laughs> you know, either way, it's going to be very dramatic. But as you are correctly saying, I mean, with the moral compass, you would you would definitely say that uh, what's currently going on is just so dramatic in Palestine that there's just no more justification of of keeping these these deals um under the hood because that's the whole thing. It's the the demand is we want to know what's going on and we want you to step back from these engagements. Um, the the question for me at the moment is like, what do what are these students risking? Um, are they still going to their classes? Are they are they graduating? Are they like what? They, a lot of people put a lot of their future on the line at the moment, right? Not just by reputation, but by way of the university. Probably, maybe. I mean, these, these, do the students who who are there do they still go to their classes or not? Some students. Uh, so exams are over. Uh, exams finished. My understanding is they finished in April. So exams are done. Um, and uh, so those students who uh, uh, they finish their exams, uh, and, uh, you know, in April, they, oh, they're, and if they're in the final year, they're done their, their education. They're just waiting to graduate in June when they get their degree. Uh, some students have told me that they've actually withdrawn from classes and they won't be enrolling until the university discloses its, its investments. Uh, that are tied to Israeli uh, uh, firms and companies that are sustaining and aiding the occupation. Uh, the students are risking being expelled, as, uh, in, uh, essentially. Uh, that's, that's, that's the main risk. And the university has kind of, you know, initially they said that there will be disciplinary measures for faculty and, and staff and students, and now they've walked that back. And But there is a, a, certainly a chance that if graduation comes near and the, there's no sign that the university is, is willing to meet the demands of the uh, of the students, then there is a then there is chance that you know the president will start issuing ex, you know suspensions and and uh, you know, expulsions and uh, it could be a repeat of what happened in Colombia all over again. So that is the ultimate risk, and of course the faculty are risking their jobs, which is um, you know even more significant if you have a mortgage and you have, you ch you're supporting children. Whereas, you know, the students, they're students and they're they're taking government loans to pay for their education, where, of course, it is a huge thing if you're getting expelled or suspended from your educational institution, and of course, you study. But, you know, at the same time, you're, you're living at home. There are some international students as well. So that's a huge thing where you don't have your family here. So, you know, those are the risks. You know, it's a, it's a financial risk. It's a, it's a risk towards being able to be unable to continue your education. I think those are that's that's the risks that are that these uh, individuals that are protesting are encountering. And the students that you spoke to, 
like you said, they're younger than you, right? They're 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, <clears throat> how do you explain to yourself that a 17 year old understands the gravity of the situation much better than a lot of 45, 50, 60 years old who still think that this is, has something to do with Israel's right of self-defense? How is it that the gaslighting obviously didn't work on the 17 year olds the way it did on, on some other generations? Not all, not all, but you know, it's, it's student protest. It's not like middle-aged uh, 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 factory worker protest. <laughs> it's student protest. Why did it work on the young? Uh, I I I think that um, that the young that the young students are are not embedded on, or brainwashed with the ideological views of Zionism that that I think that are so affecting the older generations. They just see all these uh, innocent Palestinian civilians being massacred and it's being done with total impunity. There's no, there, the Israeli government isn't being held accountable and they don't, they aren't aligned with the Christian fundamentalist uh, angle, you know, uh, that, that view that, you know, you know, that Israel's the Holy land and, you know, everything Israel does is sacred. And the Bible says that, you know, that, that you know, that Israel is, is the land of the Jews and, so they don't they don't identify or align with that, and they they aren't buying into the mainstream media narrative that uh, Israel is the victim and and, it, and all the blame goes on Hamas. And I think that that's the fundamental disconnect that's there. And um, you know it's it's also interesting because in Israel you have the um, the opposite situation in a way, although it is true that the uh, that the uh, that the older generation they are. Uh, you know, supporters of Zionism, supporters of the of Israel's uh, war on Gaza, the young individuals in Israel are so extreme, so uh, so hardline that they think that you know Netanyahu isn't doing enough, you know, in Gaza. He should, you know, some are even calling for uh, Israel to drop a nuclear weapon, you know, an atomic bomb on Gaza. You know, they they feel that uh, the government isn't going hard enough. And they support the government, but so you have that opposite situation out outside of Israel. You have you have the case where the young people they're the ones that are progressive and are calling for an end to the occupation and are really standing up to you know uh, these Zionist uh, uh, hardcore fringe you know individuals that predominantly seem to be middle aged, forty, fifty, sixty year old individuals and above. Yeah, it's, it's, fasc it's fascinating at the moment, and I have nothing but admiration for the students who do that because this is, um, it, they're proving that you can have an impact, but you need to risk it all. And we've seen, I mean, the Vietnam War would have taken another turn had it not been for massive, massive protests on the street that the government somehow needed to, 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 uh, to, to calm down again. And this is, by the way, where the United States learned its lesson of how important it is to have, to have media control. Uh, if you if you want to uh, fight a successful war in 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 a mass media environment, and I do I I do suppose that the social media environment is something that we will see more crackdown as a result of this one. Not not that that hasn't been going on already, but um... and and when I attended the uh, when I covered the University of Toronto encampment, while I was there, a liberal member of parliament uh, was also there. And I got a chance to speak with her. The Liberal Party is the party that is is governing. Uh, that's it's it's the uh, it's the party that uh, the leader of the party is Justin Trudeau, the Liberal Party. And I got a chance to speak with a Muslim uh, Liberal member of Parliament, uh, Salma Zaid, and uh, uh, she is not Palestinian to, uh, uh, to my knowledge, but she is uh, she is uh, she is Muslim. And uh, she's somebody who said that she's here to support, to show her solidarity with the protesters. And, you know, I asked her, well, how do you reconcile your position of supporting, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, student protesters with your bosses, Justin Trudeau's position uh, of refusing to really uh, impose any accountability on Netanyahu for uh, his, uh, uh, his war crimes, his atrocities? And she responded with, uh, well, you know, in the Liberal Party, we all have, you know, diverse viewpoints. And I've, I've conveyed my, uh, my concerns to the Prime Minister. And, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Canadian government is a signatory to the International Criminal Court. 
and whatever the International Criminal Court decides, uh, our prime minister should follow that. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's like, but it still doesn't really get to the heart of the matter, which is that how could you support a prime minister who refuses to hold Israel accountable for its atrocities, uh, you know, that's carrying out against Palestinians. And it just essentially, you know, gives Israel total impunity, totally sides with the United States in uh, in uh, defending Israel on the international stage. And she really couldn't come up with an answer for that. She knows that she is out of place of uh, in terms of being in the Liberal Party, but she, you know, uh, she just can't give a real honest answer to that because that would mean, you know, indicting Justin Trudeau. She can't do that and, and, and keep her job at the same time. Another individual who was there is Naomi Klein. She was also there at the encampment. And um, uh, she also spoke with uh, a lot of the young individuals. And she she was there um, uh, on, on more than one day uh, of the encampment. And so you had a lot of people that were just coming and showing a lot of noted, notable, distinguished individuals just coming and showing solidarity with the uh, with the protesters, which I felt was very encouraging. And you had an environment where there were books that were uh, there. Had, there had a small library within the encampment where uh, you had books about Naomi Klein, Noam Chomsky on Palestine, Edward Said. So all these students were taking these books. And you just you could just loan them out, and they were becoming exposed to all these you know critical thinkers that you know they, they had books on like manufacturing consent, which like you know 18, 19 years year old they would have never been exposed to that had they not been part of this encampment. So you added the encampment was a really educating atmosphere. It was a very like uh, a very welcoming, very uh, uh, you know like a holistic kind of uh, environment, and that was really eye opening to see. And yet so many young students that were just so eager to come and check out all these books. And, uh, and I, I can't think of another circumstance where you could have kind of stimulated that kind of uh, engagement. And it's so, uh, uh, you know, enriching that, you know, the students decided to, um, you know, take this opportunity to really educate, uh, you know, you know, themselves about all these great thinkers that are out there. And I got a chance to, you know, ask. Uh, uh, I had a I had a shirt that I had custom made with, uh, because I was preparing to go to the encampment. I had a shirt which I'll send you the picture. I took it with Naomi Klein. Maybe you can share it with the audience. I'll send it to you. Uh, it, the shirt was it said uh, uh, "Free Marwan Bargudi" and it had this a famous picture of Marwan Bargudi. Everybody knows he's in like he's in uh, he's in handcuffs like this, and he has his head like this and. And and I and I went around and I asked people, are you do you know who Marwan Bargudi is? You know, and these uh, many of these youngsters, some of them, a uh, few of them did, but most of them uh, did not know who he was. And I told them, well, you know, he's he's the most popular Palestinian out there in the in the in the occupied territories in the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, he uh, is calling for a two state solution. There was a poll that was done in March of this year, which 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 uh, said that in a democratic election, the Palestinians said that they would support Marwan Bargudi as their leader uh, over double digits from uh, in contrast to Hamas, uh, the Hamas leader or uh, or uh, Mahmoud Abbas, that Marwan Bargudi would win over double digits. And he uh, is currently imprisoned by Israel in jail for more than 22 years under trumped up charges uh, alleging that he had killed five Israeli soldiers uh, during his involvement in the second intifada and their baseless charges and there's been a movement uh, calling for his release because he is credited within uh, uh, among Israeli academics and Palestinians as being the most important figure that could bring about a, a long lasting solution to the conflict and when I told the students, the young students about Marwan Bargudi, some of them kind of became turned off about him because they, as soon as they heard that he supports a two-state solution, they became very um, uh, uh, uninterested with Marwan Bargudi. But it's also, uh, it was, uh, I had a very passionate discussion with one uh, a, a student in particular who was a very young guy. And um, uh, he, he was, I believe he was Middle Eastern. He wasn't Palestinian. But uh, he was opposed to a two-state solution. He wanted a one-state solution. He 
he wanted uh, uh, the uh, the Jews that are in Israel to be expelled and being and to be sent back to Europe. It was a very extreme view, but it was I I could understand that his heart was you know aching over the injustice that Palestinians had uh, faced for more than seventy years. But at the same time, I feel that a lot of young students. They have to be pragmatic in their outlook and their approach while also looking at injustice. You have to look at the maximal aims that you can achieve within the constraints of the international system as it is. And the maximum gains that you can achieve is the two-state solution, which has been the international consensus, which even the United States has, uh, has adopted. Uh, and the maximum gains you can achieve is a two-state solution under uh, the pre-June 67 borders, which with minor and mutual land swaps with East Jerusalem going to the Palestinians, West Jerusalem going to Israel. And it was kind of interesting to see these these young students that were so, uh, so fired up about injustice, but also kind of grappling with their inability to look at things pragmatically, which I also faced as a youngster their age too. You don't think about things pragmatically you're just a very free thinker and you're you think that the world is just out there and you can just achieve everything and you know i was certainly in that position i think that is also why the palestinian uh the encampment at the university of toronto has been as successful as it has because these young students felt that we got to do something you know we need to take we need to take uh all the risks that we can so it, it also helps to be that kind of free thinker but i think there's also you know, risk to it when you want to advocate solutions, which can sometimes have dangerous consequences. Sorry for the rambling answer. No, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the overview of where the student protests in Toronto stand, because there's they're clearly something to watch out for. And uh, they're not over. They're not over. Even though they're fading away a little bit, they're not over. And they, uh, I, I believe we'll see them soon again in, in the headlines. 